everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In this episode, we give you 10 actionable steps that you can take to hit a deadlift PR. All right, enjoy the show. Check this out. Most of you can hit a PR in 30 days, but you have to follow the right protocol. Yeah, of course, it's not going to work for everybody, but for the most part, you should see some improvements in your numbers. All right, let's talk about. Let's well, what talk I, about it. What I like about this is that what you listed out, I think, really applies to to everyone. I do think that beginners tend to see PRs more frequently just because they're beginners, and it's in, yeah, in the, fact the novelty often, of it. Yeah, and in fact, they often see PRs in spite of. That's my doing point. Things I'm making, wrong. right? So I think yeah. that newbie gains. You might because you might have someone who listens like, oh, I don't do all those things. I had a PR last yeah. week. Yeah. Well, you know, if you haven't been lifting for a very long time and. You know, all a lot of the stuff that you do is novel. Your body's reaping. No, a lot I'm of glad those you. Benefits. I'm glad you said that because w- what we're going to talk about is for somebody who's kind of stuck. For somebody who wants to hit a PR, they've been already been working out for a while. Now, what does that mean for the newbie? The newbie, if they apply this, yes. If they don't, they may still hit PRs because those newbie gains come almost no matter what. But if they apply this, they'll hit even better numbers. They'll maximize the potential. So, in other words, this is kind of applicable to anybody. And we organize this around specifically around the deadlift. Um, and you generally, you can apply this to other lifts as well, but there's some specifics in here that apply uh, mostly to deadlift. And I've applied this to myself. Every time I do this, I don't always hit a PR because I've been doing this for so long, but every time I apply this, I'll definitely get to that upper limit and it's very predictable. It works almost every single time. Now, mm-hmm. the, the very first one that you go to, I think is a really good place to start because it's probably the one of the most common mistakes that I see is, is you get somebody who is dieting to lose body fat and then they also want to hit these PRs in this lift. And so what they don't realize is that you know, you're li- you're you're feeding yourself in a calorie deficit. Your body's in a catabolic state. Mm-hmm. So it's breaking down. It's not building and adding in that state. And so the likelihood of you hitting a PR that now that doesn't mean it's impossible. And we talk about newbies, right? Yeah. So if you've if you just started squatting and you've only been squatting for four months of your life and you're in a calorie deficit, there is a potential that you could, just because there's so much technique yeah. mm-hmm. that goes into get, being a good squatter that your technique could improve so so much that even in a calorie deficit, you may get stronger at mm-hmm. that lift. But for the average person who's been stuck in a plateau or have been lifting or been squatting for a long time, they can't break through that. One of the first mistakes I see is I look at their diet and I'm like, oh, well, you're eating to lean out, and yet you're trying to increase strength. It's yeah. tough. I- increasing calories or bumping your calories for maintenance uh, will almost, I mean, it's pretty consistent that it will raise your strength just generally. I mean, yeah. literally, work out like you're doing now, change nothing, add you know, 400 or 500 calories on a consistent basis. That's important, by the way, because people typically think they're bumping calories, but don't track and they end up making up the difference mm-hmm. uh, on a weekend or something like that. So it really doesn't turn into be a, a, too much of a surplus. But if you're consistent, like I'm going to eat 500 more calories a day, um, you'll get stronger regardless for the most part. There's all, there's almost always this like strength boost. Yeah. Now, if you combine it with other factors, you can make some huge gains. But this is key because generally speaking, this will just make you stronger. Yeah, you want to add adic- adequate uh, reserve of energy and, and to have that to be able to tap into. And I think too, if you want to uh, kind of add in a little bit of nutrient timing with this as yeah. well, in terms of like, you know, cycling your carbs or like doing it in a way where you're actually like deprived a bit. And now we're introducing it before you're going to, you know, attempt a lift. That's like a PR lift. You know, you could kind of play around with that and it in does fact, make a fact. In fact, we get more specific with that later on. Yeah. But with this here with the calories, there's a couple uh, points I want to make. One, an easy way to do this is if you don't feel like tracking or whatever, but you normally eat kind of the same all the time and you know this about yourself, all you have to do is add an extra meal. So it's kind of an easy way to bump your calories as long as everything else stays consistent. And then the second thing I'll say is through experimentation with myself and with clients, the calories should probably come from proteins and carbohydrates. I don't typically see the same strength bump when we add the extra calories with a lot of fat, unless the person was eating too too low fat to begin with. And then we see this huge bump in strength. I, I mean, I'd like to add to that, that I would, for the, for the most part, for most people, I would go protein first. And yeah, the reason why that is, is just because a majority of clients under consume protein or they weren't even, the, they weren't at the upper th- threshold of the, the maximum amount for the max benefits for protein synthesis and building muscle. 
So I would tend to push them in that direction. Now, that being said, if you're eating a ton of protein already, then I think carbohydrates are going to benefit yep. you the most. But I think that's a, a, a more rare case. Maybe someone like you, right? Like I think that you eat a lot of protein uh, on a very consistent basis. So you could probably potentially just add carbs yeah. to your but diet. Even I add proteins and carbs. You do. Yeah, I go proteins and carbs with the extra meal. Um, like you guys have seen me, and I did this recently, and all I did was extra, add an extra meal. My extra meal was uh, steak and uh, potatoes. Mm -hmm. So carbohydrates and proteins. And some fats came in the steak, but it was you know protein rich. And that's usually where we see the benefit. The in an increase in fat here can help if your fat intake is really low. And I don't, this is not common, but when I did see this, it was with female clients who ate too low of fat and we bumped their fat and give them get them healthier. Mm -hmm. But proteins and carbs right here, proteins being most important, car carbohydrates to make up the difference. Now you didn't list this on your list, but I know that personally, one of your favorite things and why you probably did the steak is because you like to increase cholesterol at, at a time like this too. Now, what that, are your thoughts on? I know you didn't put that right, in this it's list. A little controversial. I, yeah, I specifically didn't because it's a little bit more controversial and I guess I don't know nuanced because it doesn't. It's not as important as the proteins and carbs. Like it's not going to make as big of a difference as just extra calories, right? Proteins, carbs. But yes, studies will show that um, if you do this short term bump in dietary cholesterol, your CNS t tends to fire a little bit stronger. And I do this all the time. If I I, I go from eating. You know, six whole eggs a day to 12 yeah. whole eggs a day, which that's just me. Um, I'll notice a bump in strength, even if my calories are all the same. Well, you saw old time strongmen used to drink a lot of like heavy cream and yep. and things like that to, to really aid in their performance. Yeah. So that's just a little bit more nuanced. Yeah. But I mean, for everybody, bump your calories, be consistent about it, uh, proteins and carbs. That alone will get you generally stronger. All right. This next one's interesting. This next one's interesting because people always dismiss it in this is probably one of the this probably one of the most consistent ways to get yourself stronger and that's literally to aim for 8 to 9 hours of sleep every night. Now notice how I didn't say 7 to 8, right? Mm -hmm. 7 to 8 is the normal target. I found with myself and with clients that when I aim for 8 to 9, I almost always fall at least at 8. When I go 7 to 8, I tend to sometimes go 7. That extra 30 minutes to an hour, <clears throat> even in one day, even if you have one night of good sleep, you'll notice that you're stronger the next day. But over 30 days, this one makes uh, a So huge is difference. that the thought process of saying 8 to 9 hours is because you, we know that most people, if you yep. tell them 8 to 9, they're probably more likely going to hit 7 to 8 and they're going to fall a little short. Yeah, it, it, it usually results in more 8-hour nights than saying my target is seven to eight. So I'm saying aim for it, right? So you're like, okay, I'm going to wake up at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Then I'm going to bed by 11. Yeah. So that's my nine, right? And then if I'm off a little bit, I tend to hit it. Usually what people do when they go seven to eight is they tend to veer towards seven, you know, a few nights a week, right? Oh, you know, seven hours is good. That's supposed to be good too. And you end up losing a little bit of sleep. That extra 30 minutes to an hour makes a big difference. Yeah, I used to, I mean, I talked to a power lifter that was like a real... Um, competitive power lifter, real good at, at the sport who would literally like swear by naps and like, yes, just like, he's like, as much as I can um, emulate a baby as possible, <laughs> like, this is what I'm my goal is to increase my strength. And oh, I was just like, always sleeping, was like getting eight, 10 hours of sleep, but then also napping throughout the day. As well. now, what do you think is the most, what's, what do you think it is the most there? Is it uh, the stress? Is it the actual rest? Is it the recovery? Is it a combination of all three? What do you think is, is, so valuable about the, the, the amount of time that you give yourself rest Dude, every day. It's all those things. Yeah. So. Um, it's the, the, the management of inflammation so that it's appropriate. So you get the inflammation signaling, but you don't get too much inflammation to where. So that's the managing the stress, managing okay. stress, uh, hormones, you get more growth hormone release, IGF one, you're, right, mm -hmm. you're more primed for testosterone. Um, you're not going to get your cortisol, is more appropriate. In other words, you get the spike of cortisol in the morning, but then it goes down nice and low and the evening allows for um, recovery. Um, it's uh, it's very, very nourishing on the CNS. The CNS needs breaks, mm -hmm. okay? And if you're training hard, especially if you're lifting heavy, you know, that's yeah. stressful on the yeah. CNS. You're cranking that amplitude to its max capacity. So to be able to give it some adequate rest you, is important. You know what? Think of it this way. It's like you have an iPhone, right? There's a battery in your iPhone. So that's like your CNS or your body. Well, imagine if your battery needs, you know, eight hours of charging and you always give it six hours of charging every night. You're only going to get so much of that battery output. Well, that's like your CNS. So that sleep 
charges your batteries. And a full charge is going to give you more power mm -hmm. than an almost full charge. Yeah. So sleep makes a huge difference. And studies will show the opposite, too, effect. If somebody loses sleep, you notice an immediate drop in strength almost every single time. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway is MAPS Strong. This is the Strongman-inspired workout program. Here's how you win. Uh, leave a comment below this video. Within the first 24 hours that we drop this video, also subscribe to this channel and turn on the notifications. Do all those things, and then if we declare you the winner, we'll let you know in the comments section. Also, we got a sale going on uh, this month on a at-home workout program bundle. So here's what it is. Maps Anywhere, Maps Suspension, Maps Prime, and the No BS six-pack formula. All of those combined in this bundle for only $99.99 which is the price of basically one program. So you get four programs for the price of one. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get set up. All right, here comes the show. All right, so he, now let's get to the more specifics with the deadlift. If you're trying to bump your deadlift strength, you should definitely deadlift heavy at least once a week, or I should say stick to once a week. You're going to deadlift more than once a week, but heavy once a week. More than one day a week of heavy deadlifting tends to be too much uh, for most people. Now, heavy is very relative, right? So what what would you say is a heavy deadlifting session for somebody? Like how, what, and I know- what percentage are we going to go Yeah, well, I know in our powerlifting program, we use the the RPE model. I know that that's like, people like want to hear a percentage, yeah. but what's a, what a more general way that you would recommend the audience? Like, okay, I'm going to start deadlifting heavy once a week. What's my heavy look like? Okay, so um, I'll change the terminology and say deadlift- uh, hard or intense once a week. So stop about one or two reps short of failure and keep the reps low. So you're looking at doing sets of one to three reps. And let's say it's one rep. Well, it's something you could do two or three with, or if you're doing three reps, it's something you do, you know, four to five with, and that's your training set. So it's hard, heavy, and keep the reps low and the intensity is high, but we're not lifting to failure. You're, you're not trying to max out your deadlift until you get to the 30 day mark when you're trying to hit your your PR. Okay. So basically practice with that heavy weight. So it's like someone like me, if I if I could max out at 500 pounds, I'm probably gonna do, you know, singles and doubles with 400 yeah. for, you know, five, five, six sets. Or, or no, maybe even more, 450, you know, something like that. Yeah, that yeah. Close. Okay, so you're getting close. You're getting close, but you're, you know, you're still 50 pounds off your lift. So it's something challenging, but mm -hmm. you're like, I could add, you know, 40 pounds to this if I wanted to really, okay. you know, type of push it. And you're practicing that heavy lift and you're keeping the reps low. And the sets should be relatively high, you know, four to five sets type of deal. Um, next up is the one extra. So nothing's going to get you better at deadlifting than deadlifting, right? Mm -hmm. But there are exercises that have carryover. In my experience, the squat has the most carryover to the deadlift. If your squat goes up, your deadlift tends to go up. So squat heavy right. once a week. Now, here's the key with this. During your week, the squat should happen before the deadlift. So in other words, if you're training Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Monday is your heavy squat day. Wednesday is your heavy deadlift day. I don't like deadlifting heavy in the week and then going to the squat. That tends to is that your, cause problems. Is your theory on that because the deadlift is so direct on the back yep. and then that fatigues and then doing something like a heavy squat, which you need some core and low back strength to support a heavy squat that you don't want that to be fatigued from the deadlift. This is mostly risk management. Yep. So in my experience and in, in you know training clients, I don't know if you've got have experienced this where you go try and squat heavy a day or two after you deadlift heavy, mm -hmm. doesn't feel too good. doesn't feel very safe. Versus if I squatted heavy, even if my legs are a little sore, yeah. I can still pull Well, anytime my back's a little fatigued and then trying to brace and, and make sure that, <laughs> you know, that's that, that mechanism's in place when I'm going to squat, you know, that's a consideration. You gotta, you gotta make sure that, uh, you know, you're not going into it with fatigue. Otherwise it's you know, gonna put it's, you susceptible. It's funny that we're talking about this because it, one of my things that I have never been able to put together is the times I've hit PRs in, in deadlifting, I actually squatted pretty heavy earlier in the week mm -hmm. and I was kind of sore a little bit. Yeah. Like I wasn't, I didn't even think I was fully recovered from my squat already, but I, I was, I was lifting heavy on squatting and then I at least had a day or two recovery. And then I went into my deadlift and my, and I pulled some of the best weight and I remember it still feeling it a little bit from my squats, but then still having this incredible deadlift. So that's like a good that anecdote. Recruit, the recruitment process, right? With the, with the legs and, uh, you know, obviously with deadlift, like if you get more leg drive, that's going to contribute quite a bit. You know what else I kind of contribute to it? And I don't know if this is true or not, is that I'm a, I'm a little tight and stiff. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that, that actually 
favors it, you it, it in, helps. in a deadlift because mm -hmm. a deadlift is more of a rigid lever movement versus a you know squatting down and so the fact that i I'm, i just lifted heavy squats I'm, I'm still a little pumped and tight from the two days later going into the deadlift kind of stiff and rigid so, like that so this is an interesting anecdote mm -hmm. i don't know if there's data to support this but i agree with you so i always will hit a pr in deadlifts if i hit close to a pr in squats Two days before so see, that happens to be every yeah, that's every every, every, every PR I've hit <laughs> that well, I've I've correlated that I'm like that's yeah. weird. Well, hmm. and the, and the tightness thing is interesting because because with the deadlift you don't have the I don't know benefit I guess of lowering the weight before you lift it. With the deadlift you're lifting it off the floor, right. and how tight and tense you can be at the start makes a huge difference. Whereas if you're with the squat and you're lowering properly, you're kind of naturally having to be tight because you're lowering into the hole. With the deadlift, if you start loose at the bottom, yeah. you're losing a lot of power. You have to create that all before you get into it. Yes. Yeah. And and two, uh, you know, really getting the lats engaged is something that totally. uh, people like don't consider. If you can really kind of set yourself in that position and, you know, direct it more to the legs, you're going to have a lot better lift. Yes. Now with the squatting heavy, this would be similar to what the deadlift you're doing, you know, singles, doubles, triples, you're, you're working at a high intensity, but you're not going to failure. You can even sub sub substitute this for box squats. I found box squats to be just as effective. Um, the reason why you may do a box squat instead of a traditional squat is if squatting heavy and deadlifting heavy just is working the hips and low back a little too much, then you can do that. But uh, squat heavy once, then deadlift once, heavy in the week. Now, the next one is a different exercise that I've also noticed good carryover to the deadlift. And that is the hip thrust. Mm -hmm. You also want to hip thrust heavy once a week. Now, here's what it looks like. In the beginning of the week, you do a squat, a heavy squat session. Then you do a, head uh, a heavy deadlift session. At the end of the week, you do your heavy hip thrust session. Works out great. And the hip thrust has got really, really good carryover, especially as the weight gets above, uh, right. you know, it starts to get past that the last mid bit, right? Yes. So the, the that full lockout. extension lockout of the hips. So yeah. if you're programming like that, you got, you just need three days a week where you're doing these, these kind of heavy compound lifts. Where is the auxiliary deadlift type stuff going on? Like, where are you fitting that in? So you can do light deadlifts uh, on the hip, hip thrust day if you yeah. want. Yeah. And there is just technique. Yeah. Technique, form, you're, you're looking at, you know, really staying in the hole, staying tight. The people that I would have do this are people who really need to work on the, their biomechanics and their feel for the deadlift. If your deadlift, like for me, deadlifting is very second nature. I get right into it. I usually don't even deadlift uh, a second time a week. But if I'm working with someone and I notice like we really need to work on getting the bar in the right position, staying tight, they either get too low or too high at the beginning of it, mm -hmm. then I'll have them do a light deadlift session. So what my, my routine looked like around this time when I hit my PR was I had a day where I was doing uh, like light deficit deads and then I would be doing light speed pulls yeah, combined with great. one heavy load day. Yeah, I like that. And then I would put those on the, so like if I was squatting really heavy, I would, I would still probably deadlift like deficit deads, but really light. It would be really mm -hmm. light, full range of motion, mm -hmm. going really deep, controlled, squeezing the top. It was just like a, maybe eight to 10 reps, higher rep range. Um, and a lot easier weight. And then on the hip thrust day, I might be doing like speed. speed I like pulls. that. I like that. Now I want people to, you know, as they, as they listen to this, you're, you're giving you, you know, lots of different options Err on the side of less, not on the side of more. Yeah. You're already doing one taxing day. You've already, you're already saying to me that you're, you're pushing weight. That's close to a PR. That's more than enough yep. to to elicit some some growth change. You and, still want it in the tank, you know? You yeah, they're ready to go. Right. Plus, I noticed with strength, um, even more so than hypertrophy. With hypertrophy, now strength and hypertrophy super closely related. So what I'm about to say is a little bit like not quite splitting hairs, but it's getting there. But that is that um, training less tends to get you more strength, and pushing your capacities a little more than that tend to give you more hypertrophy. So in other words, part of strength is your energy, how good you feel, how fresh you feel, how good your CNS is. Whereas hypertrophy, there's a little bit more stress damage. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of pushing the lim limit a little bit. And we're getting, you know, building muscle. But when it comes to strength, it's like, you know, if you hear all the things that we're talking about, you're like, I'm going to add all of it. You're probably better off doing less when it comes to trying to hit a PR rather than doing more and more and more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah, one no. of those things. No, no, it's a good point. All right. And the last one, or not the last one, the next one, is on that third week, because this is a 30-day process, right? So we're trying to do four weeks to get to a PR. The week before the week, you're going to try to hit your PR. This is when you go light. Yep. 
This is when you lift light. Practicing the the lift. Yeah, you want to get into your lifts. You want to train at much lower intensity. You just want to feel tight. You want to feel good. You want to feel strong because what you're trying to do is allow your body to really recover and be fresh for that following week. Now, so is light considered still relative to the day that you like? So let's say you still have a heavy lifting day, but now. When you said before, I might be doing 450. If my max is 500, I'm doing 450 singles and doubles or whatever. Uh, now I might do 350 or yes. 400. Yes, 350. Okay. Yeah, I'd go way down. Oh, even down to 350. And I'm just, yeah, I'm just going through the technique and the form. And, you know, feel it a little bit. I mean, you're still, you know, you're still lifting. Yeah, yeah. But you're not lifting with uh, anywhere near uh, the intensity. And the idea is to come out of that week really recovered fresh yeah, you know, yeah in fact some people this is not true for everybody but some people take it off take a week off and yeah. come back even stronger now it's not going to happen for a lot of you for a lot of you you still want to train that but week. the lesson that you're 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 trying to teach right there and the point you're making is that you you could easily overdo it you're less likely to underdo it in that final week mm -hmm. so if anything err on the even lighter side mm -hmm. You know, and and just go through the motions, and not you do not want to be getting sore from those workouts, getting ready to lead into the next. No, in week. fact, studies show that you know, because some people will call this this would be similar to what do they call it, active recovery week, or uh, what is it the term that they use for the week where you train deload deload. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, a deload week. Studies show that the deload week is where the majority of the muscle and strength gains happen. So, like people train, 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 they get some progress, and they do a deload week, and then the body's adaptation just advances like crazy during that deload week. Um, if you like to work out a lot, you'll probably have noticed this yourself when you do something like go on a vacation. You go on a vacation for a week, you don't work out, you expect to come back and be weaker and all of a sudden you're stronger mm -hmm. on all your lifts. So that's kind of what's happening here. And with this, you want to set yourself up for that fourth week because your goal that fourth week is, I'm gonna hit a PR on my deadlift. So you basically wanna lift light uh, that week and just kind of go through the motions, feel the technique and the form. Now what is, is, okay, that's specific to the deadlift. Now what about everything else? Everything. Okay. Yeah. Everything you're going, you're going, you know, relatively light in comparison to how you were training the week before. So you're still doing a workout, but you're not really training that hard. You're feeling super good, super fresh. At the end of that third week, you should feel like, like ramped. Like yeah. I'm ready to go. I love really getting into the like nitty gritty and the nuances of everything yeah. with the grip and, and just, you know, really setting uh, my entire body up mechanically to, um, so, so it's like you go to step into the heavyweight, but you've done it so many times and repeated that process that it's like an automatic response uh, going into a heavyweight. This weight. is where I practice the little things that make the deadlift more efficient. So like I'll practice pushing my legs through the floor mm -hmm. Uh, the feeling of that versus versus rip you know pulling the bar off the ground yeah really bending outward with with my hands so activating my lats, lats. Yeah. yeah i'll activate my lats drop my shoulders activate my lats i'll practice that pushing my legs through the bar through the floor i'll practice taking the slack off the bar before i lift meaning mm -hmm. i pull up on the bar just enough cuz you know when you first lift the weight the, there's a little bit of slack on the bar in terms of you know maybe where the barbell is in the in the plates or whatever so i pull up on it a little bit create a little bit of tension activate the lats, bend the bar, push my push legs out. through and yeah. drive my hips forward. And this is when I'll practice that that technique so that when I go for that heavy lift the final, final week, it's like, it's on. Now, what you guys are kind of alluding to that I think is interesting and probably why Justin, I think, enjoys this part of it so much is almost the, the sport of it. Oh, mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. Um, and, and you create a ritual out of it. Yeah. And what that reminds me of too, you know, I shared a, a while back the, the research on this that I thought was really fascinating where they had the three different <laughs> uh, case groups that uh, shot the free throws. And then a certain amount that didn't shoot as many free throws. And then the person who did nothing but visualize yeah. shooting the free throws. And actually the person who visualized shooting the free throws as much as the person who actually shot the free throws saw almost the same percentage of increase. Yeah. Something I also remember during my PRs mm -hmm. of, of any lifts was the lead up in this time of this month. I'm thinking about it a lot. Yes. I'm like, I'm, I'm all, I'm constant. I'm, I'm thinking about tomorrow I'm going to deadlift. Oh, I'm going to focus more on this. Like you're talking about the grips and these things like that. Like I was so into deadlifting. Uh, and I really remember this because it was when we all first got together and I really, for the first time in my life was trying to see if I could get my deadlift up really high. I never up before that mm -hmm. had cared to do that. 
And so I was thinking about it all the time, mm -hmm. all my lifts, yeah. all my workouts. Every time I approached the gym I, that day when I was, okay, I'm going to deadlift today, but when I do it, these are the things I'm thinking about. And I was processing that through my, my yeah. head, even when I wasn't going through it. Well, I think I that has a lot. Apply to the chalk the same way. I'm like stomping my foot to dig. So I'm getting a good anchor point there. And, and like all those things we talked about with, you know, how we, we really focus on bending the bar and we get our body like really set up to be as rigid as possible. Oh yeah. I mean, a hundred percent, you know, that's, that's all those things. And then some, I mean, I'll walk up to the, to yeah. the bar and I'll visualize that I need to rip something off the ground to save somebody, or I'll grab the <laughs> yeah. bar and I'll make this angry face and try to elicit a for, you know, a, a feeling of anger and I'll uh -huh. practice that. Uh -huh. Right. Because then it gets me in the, in the zone. A lot of people don't know this, but strength is so much a skill and so much your technique and so much how your ability to elicit the right emotional response that the difference between a PR and just being, you know, lifting kind of heavy is there. I mean, you, you can add 10 pounds, 15 pounds to a lift just by, you know, manipulating your technique by 1% or tension or feeling or the right emotional response. So it actually makes a difference. And that's the goal. The goal here is to hit a PR. So our I, our goal here is to use everything we can to squeeze out uh, every single pound. All right, next is uh, really in reference to the rest of the body, and that is to train with moderate intensity for the rest of the body. So a, lot, a big mistake that people make when they're trying to hit a PR in a lift is they try to hit a PR in every lift uh, at the same time. So they're going through like the strength cycle. Now there's nothing wrong with that. And you can definitely increase your strength across the board. And this is why I think people get confused is when they get stronger, they tend to get generally stronger. But if you're trying to hit a PR in a specific lift, it's going to be really hard to push your body to also hit a PR and overhead press and bench press and rows and pull-ups and stuff like that. So you want to train everything and you want to train everything good, but your goal isn't to go crazy on everything else. You want to leave that for the deadline. I think that this mm -hmm. tip is so important. Um, when you're, so back to my point of I'm thinking about the deadlift all the time. So when I'm doing other exercises, I'm, I'm, constantly thinking about how it's going to affect my deadlift yeah. or how it was going to complement it support what I'm doing. That's or right. Or, away? Yeah. Right. And so I would, I would consider my programming and my choice of intensity on other exercises based off of what I wanted to do from the deadlift. Yeah. So if I knew I'm going into a heavy deadlift day tomorrow and I'm excited about it, I'm thinking about it. I mean, you know, I want to see if I can do better than what I did last week. And then today I'm doing like chest and shoulders and some other exercises. I'm thinking about, wait a second, when I do this, this chest stuff today, or I'm doing this and that, like I, I only want to go this heavy or I only want to train this hard <laughs> because I want to be really ready to go tomorrow. So I think that's such a, a, an important point to make that everybody kind of just kind of goes through their normal routine and they're kind of crushing the weights at everything. And what they don't realize is even if they're list following the, the tips you're giving, but then they're they smashed, you know, the lat pull down the day before, or like lots of pull ups, yep. or they did, and then they don't think that's going to affect their heavy or deadlift. Their hamstrings or something like right, that. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, they're doing leg curls really hard the day before, and then they're going to go over and they're going to do deadlifts the next day and not think that's going to affect it. Like, absolutely, it's going to affect it. And so, making sure that you're modifying not only exercises, but the intensity of exercises leading up to your everything I, I built around the week was around the deadlift. Yes. Is, and what I good wanted to, to do it. that week in the deadlift. Yeah, good way. Because you are training heavy with the hip thrust and the squat, which have carryover. But everything else, you still want to work out. So I'm not saying you go in there and don't work them out. But you're not trying to hammer them and push them too hard. Now, I, this is different for everybody. But I notice the most detrimental effects for my deadlift when I over fatigue. And this, again, can be different from anybody. But I, when I over fatigue my forearms, and how can this happen? When I hit my arms really hard, and I noticed this uh, just training over the years, like when I'm trying to hit a PR in deadlifts, I get in that mentality of just overall strength and I'll train and hit, you know, heavy curls and heavy tricep extension and all kinds of heavy everything. Then my forearms get a little tight and sore. And then where I'll fail is in gripping the bar. Mm -hmm. I can't hold on to the bar. Now for someone else, this may be too much hamstring work. I actually had a client uh, who hammered their calves and it hampered their deadlift because of the stability yeah. in the ankles. Huh. So yeah, you you want, again, I think you put it beautifully, Adam. The the idea is to center, because we're trying to hit a PR on the deadlift, is to center everything around that, not take away from mm -hmm. uh, your strength in that particular lift. All right, now, now some fun, right? Let's talk about the pre-workout supplement stack. Hey. And I'm going to be honest with you, this actually has the least amount to do with you hitting a PR, but it'll do something. 
It'll yeah. give you a few percent. Well, extra I, I would make the case that it, it gives a, a little bit more than you think so long as you haven't been already abusing it heading into oh, it. Oh, right. so good. Such so like point. this is where, you know, you hear us talk on the show all the time about cycling off of mm -hmm. caffeine for a while. Like mm -hmm. if I want a PR, I'm coming, I'm, I'm coming off of a week or two where I just cycled off and mm -hmm. now I'm starting to ramp up the usage of it. That way I'm reaping the max benefits from it. Yeah. So the first yep. uh, uh, compound is caffeine. Now here's how I like to do it ba based off kind of, you know, just to piggyback off what you're saying, Adam, you have three heavy workout days, your, your squat day at the beginning of the week, your deadlift day, and then your hip thrust day. So that's three days a week where you could take a nice dose of caffeine. The rest of the week, your caffeine intake should be low or ideally none. That keeps it fresh enough to where when it's time for you to do your PR, you take your caffeine and it hits you. The mistake people make is they'll take the caffeine every single day yeah. mm -hmm. and then it loses its effect and you have to take more and more. And then what you end up getting is more side effects and less actual results. Yeah. And obviously you don't want to take too much so where you get that shaky feeling. That's not going to aid in your benefit either. So it's like, you got to know the right dose. Uh, and I know you didn't, um, you didn't add the the smelling salts in there, but oh, I feel no, like, no. I feel like yeah. that, that would be like, a, obviously that's a, um, like a, a professional yes. uh, kind of way to, to handle it, but like, it's not for everybody, but it does it does stimulate that focus, which is really what you're trying to do is just channel all of the focus and, and direct, you know, that recruitment all in one yeah. center. Piece. Yeah. The reason why I didn't put smelling salts here is because that's, that's like it's hit too or miss. advanced is what well, I was trying it's to just hit or yeah. miss. Like yeah. you, you ever have somebody who doesn't like practice with smelling salts, use it. <laughs> like, what did you do? <laughs> yeah. I but I mean, it did, uh, it yeah. definitely helped it me when can. I did it. It so. does for me. Yeah. I always use uh, smell. I never show them on my videos, but right before I, I hit play, if you're watching me hit a, <laughs> a heavy lift, there was smelling salts uh, involved. Yeah. Yeah. But caffeine has been shown in studies to reliably increase strength in people who have uh, a you know sensitivity to it. And what I mean by that is not like they can't have caffeine, they're sensitive. What I mean by that is they were off caffeine for a bit and then they took a dose of caffeine and you see this strength boost from it. Now you mentioned something, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a second compound here in reference to what you said. You said you don't want to take too much caffeine to where you're jittery or shaky. Right. Okay. This is why we add theanine. Theanine is an amino acid that, when combined with caffeine, makes it a smoother, stimulating effect. Now, someone may think, like, why would you want it to be smooth? Aren't you trying to be angry and edgy, and don't you want all this power? Think of it this way. It's like having, um, it's like having a magnifying glass that you shine a light through, right? And the magnifying glass, where I position it, will focus the light and make a point. There's two ways I can make that the point that I'm making with the light hotter or more powerful. One way is to increase the light behind the magnifying glass. That's your caffeine. The other way is to focus the point even more. That's the theanine. Combined, you get this loud signal, which is the caffeine, and the theanine really focuses it so that when you're doing your lift, you don't have all this energy coming out of your body in other directions. It's focused to lift. That's why you want hype with focus. Hype by itself is exhausting. Mm -hmm. It actually results in energy loss. You end, you end up results in, in less strength. Absolutely. Yeah. So the theanine with the caffeine makes a huge difference. And you want a two to one ratio. So you want uh, however much caffeine you, you, you took, I like to take twice as much th uh, theanine. A lot of people think one to one is good. In my experience, two mm. to one seems to be uh, best. And when I give you guys caffeine and theanine, that's what I do. I yeah. give you guys two to I one. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the biggest point I think for all, all the supplement talk is that the key is actually to have refrain from using too much of it. And then adding it into your routine is when you're going to really reap the benefits when it comes to chasing yes. a PR. If yes. you've been taking it every day and you're consistently taking it, like the, this is where this is really going to matter very little. But if you did a good job of pulling caffeine out of your diet for a while and then reintroducing it because you're trying to use utilize like this, then I see huge benefits. Totally. For and now one more compound. By the way, this is all about 45 minutes before you're going to go do your deadlift. You want to give yourself 45 minutes for all this stuff to kind of kick in and ramp up your CNS. The last compound I'll say that you can add, and this is my own anecdote, it's called agmatine. And this is a compound closely related to arginine, the amino acid, but it has interesting pain relieving uh, effects in the body um, to where I notice when I take it, I feel a little bit more invincible when I work out. I feel like I can just generate more force because I have less stiffness. And it is a real nice combination with the caffeine and theanine. You'll find it in some pre-workouts. Uh, but, you know, a couple grams of uh, agmatine with the caffeine and theanine about 45 minutes before you're going to attempt your lift. Um, next up is something that you would do two hours before 
you're going to attempt your deadlift. And that is to have a nice meal and a lot of water. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to have a, a good, you know, 50 grams of carbohydrates, 40 grams of protein. And then I'll make sure I have, you know, maybe 30 ounces of water with mm -hmm. this meal two hours before. So I have good carbohydrates, good glycogen, good fuel, and my muscles are hydrated. And that's two hours before I do my-, my And, and you want to kind of go through this so you know what that right amount is. Yeah. Because you don't want to have any kind of sluggish. Oh, like yeah. it, I've, I've added too many carbs before and actually, <laughs> you know, uh, it, you know, went away from me in terms of like, I just felt a little bit sluggish going into the lift. And so, you know, finding that right balance is, is everything. So if you can do that, uh, obviously the week or two before and kind of work your way up to what that perfect meal is, that's ideal. How, you know, how individualized do you think this this part oh, it could is. be very individualized yeah I mean, it's a, justin hit the nail on the head too like it could be too much too little the wrong foods i mean i mean i really got to a point where um because i because the opportunity to to track for as as diligent as i did for as long as i did oh you had it down to the gram oh yeah i had i had it down to, to the gram the time everything like i had to eat two meals before we're going just because my body i needed that much calories to support that kind of my size and that kind of a workout so plus you you were training so high volume at that yes. point right so yep. the workouts before too yes so I, I i and then the and i had my my stand which is very similar to like what we the creatures i have at oatmeal i used to make my own homemade version of that that was my first meal and then i'd have a second like large breakfast and it was like steak eggs, potatoes, like nice. that was, that was the meal. And I wanted it a good two hours before. So it was fully di uh, digested by the time I got to my, my workout. And then also I had to be really hydrated too. Like, so I had to have at least like a half a gallon of water, half a gallon of water, the combination of those, which was about 75 to 80 plus grams of carbohydrates, plus the big meal of steak, which is probably and the eggs, which is mm -hmm. the cholesterol to your point. That meal, there was nothing like it. There was no, I couldn't. There was no, no supplement. There was no could, other supplement. Yeah. There was no other combination of me. And I did so many different. I played with stacking pancakes mm -hmm. and doing all kinds of like higher carb, like nothing compared to that combo of meals. So I can't stress enough how how powerful it can be to kind of play with those combinations and become aware of. And this is again back to why I like tracking so much is that. Because of that, I learned that. I learned that, like, if I ever want to really, if I want a crazy workout, I know the the foods that I need to eat. That PR you know, meal. Yeah. And, and and even just to have great workouts. Like, so obviously, uh, I'm not always chasing a PR when I was competing, but I always wanted a great feel to my workout where I felt pumped and felt ener and energized. And there is a combination of foods that, and, I, you know, I, I, couldn't support the science behind why that was so good for me. I was eating out too. I'm eating at a, a restaurant. It was a cafe. It's not like I was having like the most ideal, perfect. I'm sure there was some extra butter that was on the steak and things like that, that they cooked it in their oils. Like, so I know it wasn't the most healthy option that I could have, but boy, it, it sure was a, a great combo for me for, for yeah, hitting it. For me, it's, for me, it's uh 40 grams of carbs, about 30, 40 grams or 50 grams of carbs, about 30, 40 grams of protein. And, you know, some fat, like, like, you know, nine to 10 grams and then 32 ounces of water. That was, that's mine about two hours before. And I just have the best workouts. I'm stronger. That right there, I, I've, I've actually got it down to the pounds. It'll consistently result in a good five to 10 pounds more in my workout during with, with whatever exercise. I'm just, mm. you know, whatever that is, five to 10% stronger, I notice in my workout and then definitely more stamina. So, and this isn't really a stamina thing because we're talking about PR but if I'm gonna do a long workout, man, does it make a huge difference if I have that meal uh, two hours before. Yeah. All right, now, right before you do your lift, uh, how you prime is gonna make a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, this can be pretty individual to the person based upon movement imbalances they have or tightness or issues that they have. For me personally, um, soft tissue work is really good for PR day and I'll typically foam roll my lats right under my armpits my hips, just because of those areas seem to be pretty involved in the deadlift for me and they're, they tend to be tight. And then from there, I'll do body weight hip thrusts just to activate my glutes. Um, and then I'll do some moderate like intensity um, suitcase uh, holds or carries just to activate my QL, right? The kind of lateral stability because if mm -hmm. I hurt myself, it's because mm -hmm. that's off. And then I get into my deadlift and I do a couple, a few warm up sets working up to my, my PR. Do you guys have priming specifically for yourself? Oh, you, no, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that there not, not only is there an, an individual component here, but then there also is that sport ritual component here yeah. too. Um, 
And like, so I, I, I kind of, I prime for all my workouts right now. And I have like a, a couple things that I do that gets me my, my general priming. And then when I recall back to like my heavy deadlifting days and when I was chasing numbers like this, boy, I had a very, I mean, it, it, down to the carry my bag up, drop it down by the platform, you know, unzip, get the st all my stuff out that I need, my different shoes, all the stuff that I want. My music is already playing that I need to hear to get myself all amped up. I get down, I do my kind of easier stuff like my 90 90s and my combat lizard with rotation. Then I get into my leg swings and I'm like, it's like this 10, 10, 15 minute, like just really slowly warming the body up, starting to get ramped up with the music, the pre-workout starting to really set into my body and stuff like that and then get into the first real light light rep of a warm-up where i'm just feeling the bar and the weight and i can normally tell by that first you know 135 pounds which is nothing to pull off the ground how it comes up like what kind of day it's going to be uh mm -hmm. based off of the way i primed and set myself up of like okay i'm going to be able to get after today or or knowing which by the way too i think is an important thing that we didn't really talk about here is that i had to learn that when the the way I felt in set one would actually steer and dictate what where I was going for that mm -hmm. day. So even if I said today is my heavy four hundred and fifty pound day, if I got under there and it just didn't feel right, if this, this some of the other components, the sleep was off, if yeah. something was off, then I would scale back even more than that. But then other times I'd get in and it's like, oh, I hit everything. I can, I mean, that bar felt like it had no weight on it, pulling it up, and it's like today, I, today is going to be one of those days. Like you can feel it. I feel like you can, and and part of that is how well you prime into it to get into it and get ready. And the, the first time you touch that bar, you have an idea of what kind of day it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, for me, if I prime right and I do a yeah. good job, I go up to the bar and start with my warm up set and I feel zero, um, I don't know, for lack of a better term, hitches mm -hmm. in my form. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel like uh, it's like a two stage deadlift. Sometimes people deadlift, their hips come up too a little, little too fast or they're too low and they're pulling the bar into their shins. It feels super smooth. I also don't feel any stiffness or tightness. Um, I do feel tight, but I don't feel the kind of tightness that feels limiting. I feel tight in the sense that I feel strong. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what it feels like right out the gates. That's how I know I prime properly. I get on the bar and I lift and it's like a piston. Whoop, mar yeah. Bar moves up and everything feels smooth. And you, you alluded to like a lot of those like secondary muscles that are, are helping to stabilize everything. That's really what I'm focusing on a lot of times when I'm going into prime, uh, making sure QL, making sure, you know, like I'm getting my shoulders fully retracted. I'm getting myself so I could brace and get as rigid as possible. Uh, and one thing too, like, so in this category, like before I even go to attempt the lift, uh, like I'll take like a stick and I'm just like driving it as oh, hard I like as I this. can into the ground because I'm just, I'm literally ramping up my central nervous system as loud as possible. Uh, and that's the way that I can do that without like completely fatiguing it right away. But um, I'm able to drive and then get everything ready so that when I get to the bar, I can emulate that and I can really kind of like enhance the amount of recruitment I can get. You know, it's funny. So uh, one of our friends, Lane Norton, great deadlifter, right? He's a natural uh, deadlifter. I think he holds some records in the deadlift uh, for his body weight. Drug tested. This guy's a beast. You ever seen him when he walks up to the bar? Yeah. He stomps down, stomps down, reaches out yeah, with his arms real out. tight, uh -huh. and then he goes down. What he's, what he's doing, I don't know if he realizes this or not. I know it's his, it's his ritual, but he's turning on a CNS. Mm -hmm. When he reaches out like that, he's like, oh, he's tight. Like he's turning on. I do something similar, but I don't grab a stick and drive it to the ground. When I walk up the bar right beforehand, I do this with my teeth and I tense up my whole body. Just and what grind it? Yeah. Yes, because what it's doing is it's like it's turning on my CNS to be mm -hmm. to feel like I'm I'm going to turn it on and, and really maximize its power output. So, so I do yeah. something similar, except for my I actually go high. Like Lane does this kind of out in front. I go all the way up, but I'm actually activating my lats. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. one of the one of the challenges that I had was always bending the bar and locking locking my my lats in and, and tightening them up. Mm -hmm. So me, it's it's this quick activation of okay, there they are. So I can feel my lats. So I stretch them real quick and then I get then I get in the bar so I can tensify them and then lock in. But yeah, that I think that the the priming the routine plus you know you you alluded to uh, your uh, like your isometric hole you do. Mm -hmm. I got on a kick for a while there after you taught us the Dumphy squat, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. that's a really good one, uh, really good to, one. to prime for a deadlift mm -hmm. or a squat before. So that was something that I did for a while that I really liked. And when you've done a good job 
of knowing like how to how to prime the position you get into one of the things that's cool is that you can get right into that position and create a good isometric and that's sometimes that's what you want yeah, yeah. that's a really good warm-up right before you get in in itself yeah you're not trying to go loose heavy deadlift you want to get grab the bar get tight activate everything and then go that's going to give you more power and it's going to it's going to take the slack off the bar reduce energy loss and maximize your lift and if you follow these steps uh, your odds of hitting a PR in 30 days are pretty high. Look, if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps... If you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.